Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Salma Qureshi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the University of Texas at San Antonio's Neuroscience Podcast. Um, today is November 11th. Happy Veterans Day, everybody. Um, and we're talking to Jason Stein, who is associate professor, or will be in January, although probably won't post this until you're live with that title, um, in the Department of Genetics and the Neuroscience Center at UNC's um, School of Medicine. Hi, Jason. Hi. And with us, we've got Mel Carless. Hi, Mel. Hi. Okay, so Jason's lab studies how genome variability maps onto CNS development and risk for neuropsychiatric disorders. He's using some of the most ambitiously scaled data sets and computational tools to connect the dots at many biological scales between genes and cognition. And just there are like infinite numbers of those scales, but you're doing a few. You're doing quite a few, more than most. So. Um, so, Jason, your work is, is built on moving from genetic association, so, you know, going from, like, just GWAS studies and, and linkage analysis, to meaningful biological understanding of neuropsychiatric disorder risk, specifically in terms of causality and causal, mapping causal pathways. So, can you just unpack that a little bit? Because someone like me who's not typically, who's not a genomics person, who's just sort of getting kind of up to speed and treading water on this, is so are in my mind the genomic analyses are so correlative right mm. so what do we need to do how do you get from that correlative measurement into headed towards some sort of causal chain that ends up being about a mechanistic understanding of disease tell us about your big big picture on that yeah that's a great question so I, the, the reason that I like to study genetics is because it is uh, sort of a causal anchor for understanding all other levels of biology. Um, so what I mean by causal anchor is that when you have a genetic variation, that genetic variation uh, is with you from embryo formation, so from the very first uh, individual formation, all the way throughout your life. It is the same in every cell in the body with some few exceptions for somatic mutations. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about it is that genetic variation will lead to changes in phenotypes, like hair color, eye color, height, but height and hair color, hair color and eye color are not gonna change your genome in any kind of reliable, consistent way. So when I say causal anchor, it is, uh, in fact, like causal in the sense that there is only one directionality that genetic variation can go. Uh, there is not a directionality um, that, that sort of the reverse causality that can confound these studies. And many other types of studies for psychiatric disease, diseases are confounded by reverse causality. So for example, um, uh, there's a lot of studies where they take um, postmortem brains from cases, postmortem brains from controls, and they measure gene expression in postmortem brains. Um, but you don't know, since they were cases and they uh, you know, had some psychiatric disorder, maybe schizophrenia, they must have been on antipsychotic medications, they must have had an altered lifestyle. So you don't know if those different gene, uh, gene expression levels are due to the disorder or a result of all of the other stuff that goes along with the disorder, like, um, like having the psychiatric medications or things like that. But if you study the genetics, it is a causal anchor. It's a starting point for going towards um, the, the, like whatever happens next. So um, the essence of what you're saying, though, is true. Like, the, what are we doing? We are always, for genetic associations, it is always basically a correlation. So you're just seeing if differences in genetic variation, your x-axis leads to differences in your phenotype, your y-axis. And we do that, like, we just run a lot of linear regressions to do that. So, yeah, but I, I do like the causal anchor part of it. Yeah, so, so a lot of, so your work is so ambitiously scaled, um, and I think a lot of the approaches, and of course I'm not in this field, but my sense is that a lot of these approaches tend to be so brute forth, just looking for sort of, you know, just benchmarks for expression of this or expression of that, so, so that in that sense, very correlative. Huh. But what you're doing is so like meticulously crafted in taking different types of data, for example, imaging data of um, M MRI data from this Enigma consortium, which I hope you guys talk about because you're both part of it. Yeah. Um, and then using that as a, as a tool to kind of get at some bigger associations and, and layering, you know, different types of genomic approaches to get at very fundamental questions about, you know, what's accessible on the genome. 
this part of it makes it seem so elegant, right? Like relative to what we think of as sort of those first generation genomics that you're giving me this look, Jet. <laughs> like I, you haven't read things recently, <laughs> and, I, and I haven't. But um, but I, I think I think this is this, the idea of the, the statistical rigor and the scale of it is so important, and the power of, of what you're doing. And a lot of that is built on these collaborative consortia. So yeah. can you say something about just some of that? Can you just unpack a bit of that for us? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the sample size is always kind of the most critical factor in genetic association studies. And the reason for that is because for most complicated traits, like uh, each single genetic variant that exists in the genome usually has a very low effect size on brain structure, on risk for disease. Um, so you only would be able to detect that reliably um, by having a large sample size. So it was really critical to like have a large consortium, especially for phenotypes like brain structure. And so we started this consortium, the Enigma Consortium, um, when I was in grad school because we saw this. There were others doing this, or for example, like height was one of the first phenotypes that was studied for genetics um, in an amazingly large way. Like there's now like millions of people participating in height GWAS. And like why? Because it's like the easiest phenotype to measure. Like what is your height? So you just go to the doctor and you're like, you know, you can just get, you know, lists and lists of height for, for people. Um, so brain structure much more difficult to measure. You gotta like send somebody to an MRI, take a picture of their brain. Um, there wasn't really like the ability to measure this in large numbers of subjects from each individual cohort. Nobody had that kind of money um, to do that, that type of analysis. So then we formed, we like, okay, so get together a bunch of people, um, including like the Gobbs Consortium, uh, which is what Mel participated in. And so uh, we're just basically combining all of that data to try to get sufficient power to find which genetic variants create changes in brain structure. I, I should say too, like, you know, this changes based on if you have rare variants or common variants. Like common variants have low effect size. Common variants must have existed sort of in lo a long time in evolutionary space. So you're, you inherit variants from your parents who inherited variants from their parents who inherited variants from their parents. And you know, those variants can be selected for or against in the population. But like, if it's common, it must have sort of like been okay, like sort of not, not been under strong positive or negative selection, probably under drift basically for a long time. And so these variants, like, they just sort of exist in the population um, and uh, they, that they have low effects. Like if you have a microcephaly associated variant, for example, creates like very small uh, brains, uh, that would lead to big changes in brain structure that probably is not going to be passed on. Like that variant is not going to be passed on. So rare variants uh, can have very large effects on brain structure. Common variants are going to have low effects, and that's why we need large sample sizes for them. So. And so this is as simple as just collecting this data and a and a spit test. It's ha spit, having blood, the, yeah, any kind of biological or material. Reverse engineers of the IP cell. Yeah. yeah. To 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 getting getting to the genetic data, it's you know it, it can be very simple to collect. Then the MRI data is a whole. A you know, different story. Yeah, whole other space. Mm. And I mean, how many? When when you first sort of thought about this idea of you know bringing in this this big collaboration between many different groups, what sample sizes were you dealing with at that time? Yeah, so we were dealing with uh, a consortium called the ADNI Consortium, which had around 600 to 700. Um, there was one another one called the Brain Imaging Genetics or Big Consortium, around 800 or so. And there was a twins cohort uh, from Australia. Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> and so that one was, I forget, like somewhere around 600 or so. And so yeah. those are the ones we had access to like right at the very beginning. Um, and uh, so like we, you know, did some initial analysis there, didn't find anything. And then you're like, okay, well, we need more data. And so then, you know, my, my mentor was Paul Thompson. He's like, he just knows a lot of people. He would like call a bunch of people. And we had these like, we had different conferences. And I was in grad school at the time. And like, Paul uh, didn't go to the conferences sometimes, so like it was just me and then, like trying to convince, <laughs> trying to convince other people, people and yeah, you were no one at the time. To join in, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm a student, but yeah, so, listen to me. <laughs> right, and so I think you know Paul did a great job. I think of like emailing people beforehand and like setting it up, and then there were also sort of advocates that were there, including David Glan, who was part mm -hmm. of uh, Gobs, and like Tom Nichols, who were, like were just like you know really good, well-known people in the field that were like, this is a good idea. We should sign on. Like yeah. we should do this. And then, you know, for some reason that people, people kept signing on and there was like more and more data. And I think once it sort of snowballed, people realized like, oh, this is a great idea. Like we should just keep We've got to get in on this now. Yeah. 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 So, I, so, so Patrick Sullivan and Dan Geshwin have that 
review, which is about yeah. just taking the ha aligning the building these architectures and then aligning them. So there's the genomic architecture, there's the regulatory functional genomic architecture, which you, which you're doing a lot of on. Yeah. Um, he he sort of defines this, a cellular and pathway architecture, which in itself I can imagine there are like <laughs> so many different so many architectures levels. within there. Yeah. Um, and you're sort of you're living in this space that sort of traverses a lot of those. So with the micro structure, macro structure. Yeah. Um, and it, it's super interesting because right now it's all structured function in terms of genes and some, you know, cellular or structural element of the, of the CNS. Um, but I assume it'll, I mean, I assume you have plans for a lot more, but can you, can you say something about um, the various levels that you're sort of living at and thinking about sure. and, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we try to study like genetic variation probably has like the most proximal phenotypes are, you know, chromatin accessibility, transcription factor binding, uh, differences in like protein coding sequence when it is, when the variants are actually within the protein coding sequence. Um, and then studying like, you know, gene expression levels, um, protein function, um, and then going up to like macrostructure levels. That's, that's what we're studying right now. I'll tell you there's like a lot of holes in this though, right? Okay, so. Um, one hole is that we uh, are totally missing brain function. Yeah. Um, and so we are studying, we are good at studying brain structure. Brain structure is highly reliable, like you can take an MRI of the same human twice and it looks very similar. You can take a functional MRI of the same human twice and there's a lot of noise there. And so there's been uh, much more difficulty in discovering genetics affecting brain function as compared to brain structure. Um, there's also not great ways yet, like we talked about in this lecture, of studying um, human brain function through like uh, stem cell models. Like you can do it, but you have to differentiate yourselves for six months or 12 months, and like that's awful. Like that's a long time. That, just, that has some postdoc that's going to be willing to like sit there and, and do that experiment for a long time. So there's there's a big missing hole in studying genetic effects on measures of brain function and a big missing hole also on studying genetic effects at circuit level uh, function, which is like not just the firing of one individual neuron, but like the firing of multiple neurons in concert together, which is like es the essence of what is gonna really create changes in behavior. It's not just gonna be brain structure differences, it's gonna have to be mediated through some brain function differences. So there is another dimension that you are looking at, which is this temporal dimension of early versus late. And um, say something about that. So so you're talking about temporal dimension, meaning like we study the progenitors. The and fetal versus the, adult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we are we are studying like uh, genetic variation effects on developing human cortex, and so we can do that either through iPS cell models or we can use primary human neural progenitor cell models. And we're doing both of those uh, simultaneously, and so we do find that there's a, a, a significant amount of uh, disease risk that's in the early developmental time points. That's not to say that there isn't also risk in the adult time points too, though. So people have done like these same type of profiling techniques that we've used, like chromatin accessibility um, and like regulatory element activity, and they found those in adult cortex as well. And there's definitely enrichments there uh, that they find too, specifically in excitatory neurons for like things something like schizophrenia. Um, so you know, it seems like both time points are mattering for like basically how you set up the brain can alter the function of the brain. How the brain functions also alters the function of the brain. So, like both of those things, kind of like inherently make sense. And you know, it seems like also that you you make differences in neurons, like that's going to lead to differences in human behavior. Like I think those things are, you know, actually demonstrated though now through like genetic studies. So much of what you're doing though is also sort of just a bunch of internal checks. It seems right, the yeah. reality checks on on organoids as well as you know whether these IP engineered systems are actually relevant right and, yeah and a lot of that is sort of bearing out really nicely you yeah some I think so so far sometimes it's it's pretty good I mean I think those things are super important though because you know your stem cells in a dish who knows like just because they're like growing and functioning doesn't mean that they're actually modeling the actual human brain development so you know these in vivo in vitro checks are super important so Tell us, t you, you have to say, because this is not published, you have to say something about building organoids from autistic infants and tracking progression of these organoids alongside a, an actual developing human. Is that, is, am, I, am I sort of Yeah, no, that's so? totally correct, yeah. And um, 
first of all, it's, there's, there's so many questions <laughs> just about that. Just set that study up, and I'm just super, I, I'll, I'll ask some more technical questions about that because I think it's super interesting and just what the implications are that we could all sort of have organize growing up alongside us yeah. one day, right? I mean, yeah. that's sort that's of really one cool. of the, but go ahead, say something about that since. The, yeah, so we're starting this new study. Um, uh, we are sort of leveraging an existing kind of amazing study where they've done longitudinal profiling of individuals at high risk for developing autism, um, some of which who went on to develop autism, some of which who didn't. And they profiled these individuals with MRI and behavioral phenotypes um, from six months of age all the way up to now they're like 10 years old. So it's like, uh, it's an incredibly dense uh, data set where we like have a, like a, a really nice map of longitudinally how, that, how an individual's brain structure is growing. Um, and some of them are developing autism and some of them are not developing autism. Um, so we can study kind of the cellular basis behind that. So we are now taking blood draws from those uh, individuals, like those who want to participate in the study. Um, we ask if they, um, well, we ask the parents for consent and the child for assent. Um, and then we take blood draws from them. We'll, uh, uh, from those blood draws, we'll uh, isolate peripheral blood mononuclear cells, um, which then allow us to go from there to induce pluripotent stem cells, which are like, um, you know, kind of like the embryo, they're a model system of the embryo. And then from there, we can differentiate to cortical organoids. So we have like two models. We have like, well, we have a, a model, which is their organoid development of their brain. And then we have the actual development of their brain. And so we kind of want to see like, Okay, is there, if there's changes, there's inter-individual differences in how the organoid grows, does that also model the inter-individual differences in how the human's brain actually grows? And is the phenotype here, I mean the real, the phenotype is the, gr the brain growth. Are you collecting other, because presumably you can look at any trait and, and correlate, right? Presum yeah, that's true. I mean you could look at any other type of trait too, um, but we are just focused on the cortical surface area. So we're even focused not, not just on overall brain growth, but cortical surface area. I guess you have to be able to measure it in the intact child, which makes things a little difficult. To yeah, <laughs> right. So invasive. like functions. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm just curious, like complete technical question. How do you do an MRI on a six month old or even a six year old? I mean, I have three young children and I can't get them to sit still for like yeah. <laughs> two minutes, let alone half an hour for an MRI. This is a great question. <laughs> I, they, um, you know, this is run by Joe Piven's group out of UNC. Um, and they have, uh, as far as I understand, um, they've been doing all the study. I haven't done any of this, but they have like a fake scanner mm -hmm. where they put the kids in and they swaddle them. And then they kind of like fall asleep in the MRI scanner. And then they like will scan them when they're you know just infants, and then they'll keep While doing it. While they're sleeping. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is. I think it is. You're right. It's remarkable that it works and that they yeah. don't wake up. You know, MRIs are pretty loud. They are. So, <laughs> um, but I think they they have some sort of like training. Well, I think like also those them. MRIs like you know they have a suit. They're loud, but it's it to me it, it's almost soothing. It's like that yeah, rhythm. Consistent. So maybe it helps them sleep. I don't right. know. Yeah. Yeah, if you can get over the panic, I, 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 the thought of having an MRI makes me want to run for the hills. <laughs> um, so just in terms of these organoids, I mean, this is, this is sort of one, organoid 101, but these, do you, how much variability do you see using the same protocols on the same organoids? Oh, I mean, what, is it some weird stochastic, like, who knows what is assembling or, or I mean, what? There's a lot of variability, yeah. yeah. So I mean, so there's different protocols that are used for organoids like the, um, so the sort of like one of the first ones is called the Lancaster Protocol, is sort of not directed very much. And that one uh, doesn't seem to be highly reproducible. So it will form structures that look like cortex, but it won't do so in like a very consistent way. So um, there was a paper that was in Nature by Paula Arlotta's group and Steve McCarroll, and they found that like if you grow some organoids within the same bioreactor, like all those look like cortex, but then the same cell line but different bioreactor, all none of those look like cortex. Um, and so like obviously there's like big differences like there, and there there wasn't very high reproducibility. But since then, there's been two protocols that um, have sort of tried to get more reproducible organoids. Um, so one of them was Paola Arlata's group, and the other was Sergio Pasca's group. And they've like tried to you know, make sure that if they culture the same cell line multiple times, that they'll get sort of the same phenotypes uh, consistently. And they, they look okay. I mean, I think there's still room to go, though, to like improve the reproducibility of these organoids. Because, you know, like there may be slight differences in, in um, and sort of pluripotency potential, like if they're like super pluripotent or if they're sort of primed for some kind of like uh, differentiation into some cell types and, and not others. 
And you know, I don't, I don't think it's it totally solved yet. Like you're taking these cells in a dish, it's not the embryo. So it, you know, how to make something reproducible from it is, is a difficult problem. So what does a good outcome look like from this study tracking brain growth? Because there are some fundamental neuroscience questions embedded in this about just cortical expansion, right? Yes. That you're, you're, you're looking at. So, so tell us a little bit about that. So, um, so first, like a good outcome would be that there is a relationship between in vivo and in vitro. So that, you know, our cells in the dish, which ha are made from these individuals, model the inter-individual variability that we observe. And so what does that mean? So like what our hypothesis is, is that we're going to have these progenitor cells they are going to make more um, proliferative fate decisions. They're going to make more sort of self-renewal fate decisions. They'll make more progenitors and more progenitors for those individuals that have larger cortical surface area. So that, um, and you know, on the, conversely, those individuals with lower cortical surface area will make more neurogenic fate decisions early on in development. And so if that bears out, that's like um, pretty good. It's, it's very sensible in terms of like what's called the radial unit hypothesis. Um, because it, it kind of recapitulates what is thought to be about um, differences in brain size, what causes differences in brain size across different species. And you've done these studies in, in, your ma in the mouse model with the, uh, the, the NF1 mutant. Those are yes, so, I mean, so we, there's, there's definitely been people that have, um, you know, I don't know if the NF1 model de directly tests this like uh, uh, radial unit hypothesis, but like there's been other studies, for example, overexpressing Wnt and then like you get, uh, it makes more progenitors, makes a bigger cortical surface area. And th those studies have like really sort of said like, this hypothesis is true, like at least within like mouse species. But like it's not really known if like that is actually what causes like the overgrowth in autism. There are other possibilities for the, what causes the overgrowth in autism. It could be like glia, not neurons, that are like leading to the overgrowth. Um, that is something that we could potentially study, but that's not like what our study design is for right now. There could be differences in apoptosis that are leading to like cell death not progenitor proliferation. There could be differences in like uh, overall size of the cell rather than the total number of cells. So like, it's not that our hypothesis has to be the case, like there are other possibilities for it, but this is like one possibility, like this is one hypo hypothesis that will, that will happen. So, so you've written about imaging genetics, mm -hmm. and I haven't heard that term before, but it makes perfect sense and how this is sort of gonna be a, a tool that's Kind of going to change the landscape of some of how we think about how to use genetic, like fundamental genomic data in terms of understanding things like cognition. Get us to cognition. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, so imaging genetics is like just trying to understand how genetic variation uh, impacts like the structure or function of the human brain. Um, you know, because we take images of them through MRI. Um, uh, so you know. There has been genetic variation that has been found to uh, be associated with cognition, differences in cognition amongst human populations. Um, so they can give IQ tests to uh, a large number of humans and see if there's genetic variation that correlates to higher or lower IQ. Um, they also can do like a simpler measure uh, where you just ask somebody like, how many years of school have you gone through? Um, and that's called educational attainment. So it's just like, uh, did you go through, you know, all the way through college? Did you only go through high school? Did you not even, did you not finish high school? So, um, and then you can find genetic variation that's associated with differences uh, in those. And those two are actually pretty highly correlated with each other. Um, so there's, there is genetic variation that's associated with both of those and they're, they're kind of related to each other. The educational attainment you can do on a much larger sample size um, because you, it's, it's a very easy thing. You just ask somebody, how, how many years of education did you have? Um, so, it, what we found though is that those genetic variants that are creating differences in human brain structure um, are also associated with differences, with genetic differences that are, are associated with um, differences in IQ. So genetic variants associated with IQ also associated with cortical surface area. Um, you know, I think that's pretty interesting because there's a lot of, uh, you know, good uh, arguments against these IQ studies saying like, you know, IQ or educational attainment are totally based on socioeconomic status um, and not necessarily on genetics. But it does seem like that there's so, there is some genetic basis to it um, because these GWAS studies are finding something. Um, it also does seem that like some of those genetic variants have a, a biological basis because we're just measuring brain structure. Like we're not actually asking somebody like how much education did you achieve? But they, there's still like some relationship between those two. So it kind of gives like biological validity to some of these um, these like you know right rightfully controversial um, uh, 
uh, like uh, phenotypes that have been studied, like educational attainment. So, you're not afraid of anything, are you? I don't know. Like I'm still afraid. The big, yeah. questions out there. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, Neuropsychiatric -psych disorders seem difficult enough because when we think about these traits and how they're, how they're characterized, it's all such a subjective, I mean, these are all based on mostly subjective criteria, yeah, at least in psychiatry, right? Yeah. Behavioral, or yeah, but some of them are just fundamentally sub subjective. Yeah, I think um, you're right. For things like, you know, if you just short of major depression and um, I don't know, anyway, I'm not a clinician, but it, it seems like this is a, an interesting way to start, th and, and I think this is also something probably I got from the, the Geshwind Review is sort of inverting this and starting to think about building a genetic map of these things to sort of then turn things around and have sort of genetic criteria take over. I mean, this is, is a sort of the vision of this. These things are going to feed back into each other and inform one another so that it's kind of like, it, it reminds me of the, of the of the what defines a cell type question, right? I yeah. mean, it's, it's sort of the same, like the lump or splitter question. Like it, you know, right now we have so many broadly defined genetic uh, syndrome, or I'm um, sorry, sorry, psychiatric syndromes, and it seems like genetics is the way to sort of, tear, you know, tease some of those apart. But then we need to understand the genetics in terms of those large, largely defined syndromes. So I mean, yeah. is this something that that concerns you guys who are using these sort of fundamental markers of this type of of syndrome? I mean, I guess it's easy with with potentially epilepsy, although there are many root causes. But I guess it all sort of manifests the same way. Um, but you know, m most other psychiatric disorders, I would imagine, are, are just really they have just like a broad landscape of things that could be just based on many, many different genetic, um, you know, architectures. Yeah, yeah. I think these like lumper splitter question. You know, so you're totally right. Like it's all behaviorally defined, and like you just group people into categories based on like behaviors, and it's like yeah, it's somebody's uh, um, sort of opinion at the end of like you know, basically you're behaving in a way that's like kind of not normal. Um, sort of outside the spectrum of normality. So, um, you know, I think for autism, it's been more successful at sort of defining these sub-syndromes uh, of saying like, you have a mutation in Fragile X or you have a mutation in the gene CHD8. Um, and that is like this subtype of autism. Um, for uh, other diseases, like especially for schizophrenia, there's been much more of a common variant architecture and less of a rare variant architecture. So when you, when you have the rare variants, there's like, okay, so I can classify this pretty well because um, basically the penetrance is so high. Everybody who has this mutation has the disorder. Um, but when it's like common variants, there are so many people that have the, the risk allele but don't have the disorder. So I, I, you know, I still find it hard to, to be a splitter like for highly polygenic common variant associated disorders. I still don't know how to do that. I think there are people that are trying to do clustering that, that can, you know, they try to cluster genetic variations into like risk allele categories. But I, I think that's very difficult. Like there's all kinds of other confounding factors like population stratification that like you might be getting in these type of analyses that, that make it very difficult to do, to do that type of thing. So yeah, I think if you have rare variants, I can definitely, I can see a clear path towards splitting. If you, if you have, uh, it's, it's like highly polygenic common variant disorder, I, I don't see the clear path, but I may be missing it, you know. So does it give you pause when you think about things like Huntington's, where we know, we understand exactly the defect, but yet it's been how many decades and we have no idea what to yeah. do about them. I think it's super interesting. So a Huntington gene was, uh, was discovered the year I was born. So I know how long, <laughs> it was 83. So, uh, wow. so it's, you know, I know how long it's been because you just yeah. like, oh. but um, I did see there was, um, there was an antisense oligonucleotide therapy in New England Journal of Medicine recently for Huntington's. So I don't know, I think that was just like, I don't know, some early sort of trial. I don't know how it worked. I don't know if it was successful or not, but I know that they're, I, it's close. I think it's close, but I, I agree with you. I wish Charlie were here. Charlie's our basal ganglia specialist. Okay, he knows okay. all about this and is yeah. well connected. I know I read that, that in New England Journal that there was there was finally some treatment that was actually being designed, which I'm pretty sure was antisense oligonucleotide. I know it was in New England Journal, but I didn't read it. And so I don't know what happened with it or if it was successful or not successful. Yeah, I mean, I guess it is. I mean, now I guess with, like, for example, with sickle cell and CRISPR uh, therapies, like, it, it's just a question, you know, is knowing 
the poly, if it, for, for even for single gene issues, it's been so difficult to get at the actual therapeutics. Yeah. With these polygenic things, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, but we have to start somewhere, right. and not to be. Well, and, and sometimes too, when you do the, the sort of, you see these polygenic disorders, you know, a lot of the analysis might involve, you know, pathways enrichment for certain, certain biological pathways, and then can you target those pathways rather than targeting a single gene? Yeah. You know, is that the, the optimum approach for therapy? I think that's the great hope is like convergence, like, okay, so do all of these different genetic variants converge upon some biological pathway and then you can like treat the pathway instead of like the gene. I, I don't know, like, you know, the, my mentor, my previous postdoc mentor is big into the convergence, especially in autism, uh, Dan. So he, he says that there is like a lot of convergence. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's been borne out yet, yet though. Like, is there actually convergence across many of these different psychiatric disorders? Like, is there like sort of a common pathway that you're gonna be able to, to treat? I think it's kind of like, it's, it's still a little up in the air. If there is, like, it's gonna make drug discovery like way easier. If there's not, it's gonna make drug discovery way harder, because you gotta, I guess if you could sort of bear out some of the underlying physiology, like in, in addiction, it makes sense because there's just sort of the final common dopamine system, right, that you have to impinge on. But it, it's not, I mean, I guess for neuropsychiatric disorders, there's a lot of that as well, but um, it's probably a little more distributed. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that, that um, in terms of these polygenic syndromes, does it, does it concern you at all that some of these these genes that sort of start showing up as being the, the usual suspects, that they may be, I mean, it, you could imagine a scenario where things are sort of inherited together, you know, sets of genes, and the one you're looking at is just one that's sort of linked to another gene somewhere else on the genome, and there's just through some accident of, of evolution or some sort of other mechanism that's sort of having these things sort of move together through, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if these these are sorts. Of, how how convinced and how rigorous do you have to be about looking at a gene locus as a an actual causal thing? Yeah, it is definitely very difficult. So especially so, um, you know, if you have a particular variance, uh, almost always you're going to have variants that are in what's called linkage disequilibrium with that variant. So meaning that they're just like you said inherited together generally within a population. And so that leads to, you know, you have all these different uh, SNPs within a, a haplotype block that are associated with a given trait. So, you know, you can't really say without any other information, like, which one of those or if multiple of those are causal for the trait. So you need to layer on additional information. So, like, I think that's one thing that we try to do, too, is to use, like, chromatin accessibility, because oftentimes these fall in non-coding regions of the genome. And so we use uh, chromatin accessibility QTLs to say, uh, well, even though there's many variants in the LD block, um, there's only one variant that's within the causal peak, or sorry, within the uh, chromatin accessibility peak and also affects the function of that peak. And so, like, that to me is very strong evidence that, there's, that this is a causal variant. Because um, that variant affects a, a given chromatin accessibility peak, basically affects transcription factor binding, um, and is associated with the trait. So, like, in that way you can separate all these different variants that are in LD with each other to, like, putatively one causal variant. Mm -hmm. um, of course, though, even, even then you should do, like, you know, there's like, luciferase assays that say, like, I'm going to put this variant, um, like, one version of the variant or another version of the variant and see how much that changes the regulatory potential. Um, you can, based on the output of, like, this gene luciferase. Um, or you can uh, do these newer studies called multiplex parallel reporter assays or EMPROs, and basically those do luciferase assays like in mass scale. So instead of doing like one variant at a time or even one allele at a time, you're doing like 10,000 variants at a time. And they basically turn the problem into a sequencing problem. Instead of a luciferase assay, you're gonna use like a sequencing output from those. So, I mean those, you know, like there's, there's kind of the combination of uh, using QTL studies and uh, functional validation studies like through EMPRA that are kind of optimal in identifying a causal variant. I think the, the real future of this though is, um, so there's this new technique that was developed at the Broad by David Liu um, called CRISPR prime, which is like uh, instead of making a, um, a CRISPR mutation and then you know, relying on homology directed repair to like introduce some other variant, basically you're, you're inserting, you're doing like a, instead of a cut and hope it inserts, 
you're doing kind of a cut and paste. Um, uh, they use like a, a reverse transcriptase, I think, attached to the dead Cas9 to, to be able to do this. But it's amazing. So it, basically, if we can induce a variant wherever we want in the genome, then you can just flip the allele as you wish. And then you would be able to see if that is, in fact, a causal variant, at least for regulatory things. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the next step. Beyond emperors, which are kind of the current state of the art, like I'm sure that the next step is somebody doing CRISPR prime version of EMPRA, which is like, I'm just going to change one allele at a time within a single cell, change the other allele, change the other allele, and then see differences in gene expression. This is incredible, the pace at which this stuff is being built. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> We're living a great time. It is. <laughs> Lots of progress. It really is. Like, I think it's, it's an amazing time for psychiatric genetics. Yeah. It's, there's model systems. There's the ability to do causal work by like changing different genetic variation. There's huge sample sizes. Like everything sort of like there was the candidate gene era of psychiatric genetics where nobody could replicate anything and like uh, you know everything was just like I got this but I can't replicate you know and it was just sad um, and now now it's like there's so much discovery and it's all replicating and I mean I, I wouldn't say all replicating there's. A, the GWAS studies are replicating when they're in sufficient sample sizes. The rare variant studies are replicating when they're in sufficient sample sizes. You know, people are not just publishing a tool, but like the tool works. Like you can actually use it in your lab. Like we use CRISPR in our lab. Like everybody uses CRISPR in their labs. Now, so. so how nimble do you have to be in terms of your resources and your personnel in order to be like a dot? To, because you are do, you're doing clarity on top with, and my, light shoot microscopy and all yeah. of this along with all these genomic tools, like are you gonna, it's, I'm presuming you're gonna start doing functional stuff at some point, you're so yeah, young. Yeah, that's the hope. Yeah. Um, in terms of physiology, <laughs> yeah. right? Like yeah, that's, yeah. when I say function, I mean usually in my brain, it, it means usually um, signaling, right, of some call, between cells in, in a, in a um, physiological format. But anyway, yeah. um, what is the sort of, like w at what point do you say, okay, I have enough tools and, or like how <laughs> how do you sort of delimit where it is? Is it just based on how many grants you have and who you're working with? I mean, is it simple as that? It's a lot. I mean, yeah. I think a lot of it is like how much money do you have currently? Do you have like a person in your lab that's interested that you can like convince to do this? I mean, my experience is like anytime you try a new method, it's at least a year to like get the new method up and running. Um, and, you know, probably at least another year to like do a publication off of that. Usually much more than that. So like... You know, usually it's like one one new student per project, and then you like they come in, and then you'd be like, okay, here's like two projects I'm gonna give you. We'll see, you know, we'll let evolution determine like which one is selected for or against. Mm -hmm. You know, because some project is gonna work and some project is not gonna work. Um, and so yeah, I mean, you know, the more people that you have, the more money that you have, the more that you can sort of mess around. Um, I remember we started. You know, I had a brave graduate student who just started in my lab. I was like a new PI. I was just like, let's try this weird project. We were trying to make um, cell type specific reporters because we, we had found all these regulatory elements that, and that we thought we had mapped to genes very well. Um, and so you can use those to, to say like, okay, I don't, I'm gonna use this enhancer element that specifically is active for like, let's say intermediate progenitor cells. That's the kind that we were trying to label. And then we want to like put that in front, to, in front of a GFP or something, some kind of label. To say like, okay, when that, when the enhancer is active, then we get GFP. So I only want expression. I only want to see GFP in intermediate progenitor cells. And like, Ole was very dedicated, but spent a year on it, didn't work. And I'm like, okay, well, try something else. And then he did this tissue clearing project because he was interested in that. And I was always like, I wanted, I want to figure out what causes the differences in MRI that we're we're finding. So. Yeah, I don't know. You have to have kind of like brave graduate students or postdocs that are willing to fail and like, um, you know, be willing to try a bunch of stuff and also the money to be able to do all of this stuff. It's all about the money. It is, yeah. yeah, the money matters. <laughs> the money matters. Yeah. Well, this has been super fun. I would cool. go, I have a million other things, but I think our listeners could be spared more of me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, listeners. But, yeah. I, but, but I do think, it, what is, so like, if there's a tool in the near future where you can start counting synapses, because you're already doing cell diversity in, 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 at some yeah, level, and, um, and are you just that's is that does that become part of the landscape? I mean, so many of us have to sort of reduce our system to like what we can manage in the course of a career or a five-year grant or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, 
it almost seems like the way you're, the level at which you're embracing these things. I mean, I guess maybe because it's just such a, such a fertile time in this, in this, um, you know, early phases of any kind of exploration or connection of things across scales. I think is probably the most exciting time. But like, how yeah. do you see? What do you see as sort of the borders of um, of this for you? Like, as far as what scales you, I mean, nano probably is beyond you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go to nano. Yeah. I mean, I would really, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, the border. I haven't really, I guess I, th I haven't thought about the border. I, I would say, like, where I want to go next is def definitely towards, like, treatment and neurons. Like, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think that even though we're understanding that genetic variation during fetal development is, like, very important for risk for psychiatric disorders, it, like, make, it is a problem for treatment. It is difficult. It's possible. Like, I have a colleague uh, at UNC, Mark Zilka, who's developing treatments that he would like to, you know, use for treatments for Angelman syndrome that um, in uh, in fetal development, and so and he's like, you know, identified that this is actually possible. Like, found you know surgeons and uh, people to say like that they that they can actually do such a such a treatment. He's tested it in mice and then in our neural progenitor cells as well. But like, I, I don't think I don't know how feasible that is. Like broadly, this is going to be like for rare monogenic, highly penetrant conditions. So. Um, yeah. What about the glia? Because you have found that the, that the glia are the big variable part in terms of um, the NF1. The NF, yeah, yeah. That, that they determine the, the size, or they're the biggest factor that's variable in when you have size differences. Yeah. I gotta say, I mean, so if you want to study glia, especially in organoid models, you just have to wait a long time, which I think, I, you know, it seems like people here are willing to do. I think I should be more willing to do. <laughs> uh, I don't have the patience. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you really have to be patient, but you know, there's, there's been work from the organoid where you can actually study like gliogenesis um, as long as, because you know, neurogenesis happens and then astrocytes and then oligodendrocytes. And that common model, like the organoids do the same thing. So uh, you gotta wait. And um, you know, I think that that's, I think people are always, and I do the same, you go to the lowest hanging fruit. And so the lowest hanging fruit is definitely neurogenesis. So after neurogenesis, I'm sure there's be a mass movement towards uh, gliogenesis. Yeah. And maybe Excellent. that's the future. Yeah. This has been so fun. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having hope me. Hope to hear more uh, from next time we have you back, hopefully in a couple of years. Year to show cool. Cool. Awesome. Congratulations <laughs> on your um, promotion. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate awesome. It. Thanks, guys. This has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Thanks, Mel. That was great, yeah. Okay, we'll delete it now. I told you she always comes up with questions. Yeah, these are great questions. <laughs> and you read all those reviews, too? Uh, I did. Yeah, well, I, I, I read a few. So I, I was actually, peak, you know, I always get caught on these little wormholes. And, yeah, um, that's a good review, I think. It is a really good review. And, and I really enjoyed um, yours, too. But uh, I what I got caught, my brain got caught on, I was like, oh, goodness. It's another neuroscience dynasty. Geshwin. Dynasty? Geshwin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Geshwin. <laughs> he is. He definitely has. He had so many postdocs and many of them got faculty positions. Well, I'm talking about his uncle up here. I thought it was his, oh, yeah, his Norman. brother. Yeah, Norman. Yeah, because I, you know, there's and so many brother. of these. There's, you know, the Sabatini's, the church ones, the, right, right, right. you know, Shepherd, the Gordon Shepherds. Um, anyway, because, yeah, I'm always intrigued by this because. There's a, another generation of like the, the guys who were aging who were like my advisors. None of their their kids were all like, and the uh, like <laughs> yeah, they're all like just 